what we're going to be talking about today is to use what we've been given, right? The problem is, is we may not end up using what we've been given because of all the things you just shared. You all know the battles, the struggles, whether you're, a, whether you're five or 55 or 105. Like, we have the same struggles or just different capacities at, at, at your stage of life. And we all have a tool, just like that Swiss Army knife that you see there, right? You know, we all have, we all have a toolkit, right? And we've got different skills and we need to get those out at certain times. And so you've all been given something. If it's your, in your character, it's a, maybe it's a spiritual gift. Maybe it's a, uh, a talent that you have. Maybe it's something you've learned along the way. And these, are, these, are become, these become uh, tools for you to use for the kingdom of God, right? So that's what we're going to be talking about today in chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 25 of Luke. So let's pray real quick, and then I uh, just want to get my mind centered on, on the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how the, we thank you for the fact that you would use us for your kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, you move, you speak. As I always say, Lord, get me out of the way. May it be absolutely your words, your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1, chapter 19. It's the latter part of Jesus' ministry. Shortly he'll be uh, entering Jerusalem for the last time. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature, a.k.a. he was a shorty. He was, you could say he was a wee little man. <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, uh, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, and he was going because Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, Make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. I love how Jesus invites himself over, right? right? He's just like, hey, what's up? You're hosting me for dinner. <laughs> like, it's just interesting, right? Um, anyway, verse 6, he continues down there. So Zacchaeus responded. He's like, he made haste, he came down, he received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, all the other people around. They go, what? What? He gets to host him? Remember, the culture is that they, they get to host the rabbi. Like, it was kind of a big thing, right? Because Jesus was kind of, you know, celebrity-ish status, right? Uh, when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I, gave, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also, motioning to Zacchaeus, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So let's back up a little bit. We see, uh, we're talking about Jericho, okay? Uh, so Jericho was a prosperous city at this time. Um, this, is a, this is some words from Josephus, uh, he says, Jesus, Josephus called it uh, a divine region, the, the, the fattest in all of Palestine, right? Uh, Romans would carry dates and balsam wood to, uh, balsam to, to world, worldwide, they trade them worldwide, they trade and fame, you know, fame for that. Uh, that's what Jericho was known for. It had a great palm forest, a, a world famous balsam groves, which perfumed the air for miles around. Its gardens of roses were known far and wide. Men called it the city of palms, and so uh, that's kind of where it is there. If you can see there on the screen, it was zoomed in there on the on the uh, left hand side. Um, so yeah, you know, here's a couple couple shots of modern day uh, Jericho, by the way. I mean that's it still you know exists, and just a couple snapshots of it. Um, I love the Bible because it's it, it's about actual events, actual people, actual places that existed, and we have recordings outside the Bible that these places, people, and events happened. Uh, it just gives further credence to the uniqueness and authority of the Bible, of course. Um, so 
that's Jericho. And then you've got Zacchaeus, right? I'll go, you know, I'll just go ahead just for the sake of, I don't know, leave up a picture for those nerds that want to look at the cities. Um, Zacchaeus was this chief tax collector. He was the chief tax collector, not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector. So he, he was the one who oversaw the tax collectors. They would come report to him. They'd bring in their, you know, hey, you have this block. You got this block. You got this block. Remember, the, the tax collectors in this day and age of, of, of what we're reading, they would live amongst the people typically that they, that they collected taxes from. So they're going down, knocking on doors, collecting taxes at that time of the month. <laughs> And they're going around. Could you imagine? That's why tax collectors were hated. They were, they were known. Like, you're a tax collector. I know because you came into my house and you, government wants. And a matter of fact, you, most tax collectors took extra. They'd line their own pockets. Especially the chief tax collector can actually, he can skim off the top and then report it to the Roman government, you know, what he ever wants to do, right? And so it's a very easy profession to become rich. Uh, you were, you were guaranteed a job. <laughs> the taxes will keep coming, so you they need you to keep collecting them. So it's a guaranteed job. It was paid well because they paid you well because people didn't want to do it because they didn't want to be the ones that go door to door and collect the taxes because you're going to be hated. You're going to be ostracized. All your other friends are just going to be to other tax collectors, right? Other hated people. And so there's this kind of an aloneness. Some families would disown their own kids from it, especially in the Jewish culture because you're a Jew collecting taxes for the Roman government from your own people. What's wrong with you, right? That's the kind of thing that's happened. So this is Zacchaeus. We just have a little snapshot here and as the chief tax collector, like I said, other, he's overseeing it all. He's a rich dude. He's made, it, he's made fat bank, but with his, uh, his confession that we see here in, in uh, verse 9, we see that he might have been doing, probably, most certainly, was doing some sketchy things to make his money. And that he, was, he was cheating a little bit, and, uh, and he was convicted by this, right? So he, was very, he would have been very well off. He'd been, like I said, hated because of his collection methods for scamming off the top there, uh, you know, verse 8. We see that there. Uh, he's like, look, I give half my goods to the poor. If I've taken anything from anyone by false accusations, I, re I restore four, fourfold if I have. Yeah, you did, dude. So um, so that's kind of, you know, we, we see, we, we can see the background for Zacchaeus, right? This was his past. This was his life at this point. He had everything money could buy. He had more than he wanted, more than, uh, more than he could want, more than he could, than he could ever need, of course. And yet... There's a piece of his heart that was missing. There was something missing there, not just the relationships that were broken because of his job, his career choice, and his methods, but there was something missing in his heart. And I think that's probably what drew him there. And isn't that what draws us to Jesus? Because there's something broken in us. There's a brokenness. We're broken. And we, need, we want to be fixed. And then we try to fix it, or we try to mask it with various tools, <laughs> and they don't work. We try to fill it with other relationships or other things, and it doesn't work. And we go, I, I don't know what to do. And here's Jesus showing up. He's like, I heard about this guy. And he can't see. <laughs> it's a crowd around him. Jesus is entering into the city, and there's a, you know, they, they you know, Somebody's at the gate, and there's probably some little kids. Like, oh, Jesus is here. And they're running through the town. Jesus is here. The, the Messiah is here. The Messiah. The, the quiet kid is not the Messiah, right? There's a whole tension. There's a little, always the tension there with, between Jesus. Is he the Messiah? Is he not? You know? Um, by the way, that term son of man, remember son of man, is the, that's a title for the Messiah. When he refers to himself as the son of man, he's like, I am, he's claiming the Messiah. Um, so the crowd comes. Okay, the crowd comes. And Zacchaeus can't see. You know? So, and... For the Bible to point out that somebody's short, that means they're, they're, it's, it's not just like, oh, you know, like me, like it's a short guy, right? Like actually, like they mean he's probably like sub five foot or like, like maybe five feet tall, like short dude to where he's climbing a tree, which is undignified, right, to be climbing a tree, especially as a chief tax collector. The chief tax collector, he steps on people's back to see better, you know, that type of a thing, right? So he's climbing a tree. So clearly there's a, there's a hunger here for him to climb up there just to catch a glimpse, because he's, he's going to come by. This is the main street. I just want to make sure. I, I want to just, I wonder, right? And sure enough, Jesus goes, looks up in that tree, calls him by name. Interesting. Zacchaeus, come on down. Let's have some lunch. <laughs> That's what happened, right? Zacchaeus, make haste, come down. And he, now he didn't go, 
well, I don't know, I got some things to do. Excuse, excuse, excuse. He, go, he, he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Verse 6, right? And then there's the grumblers. Isn't it funny how you, you come to Christ, you look for him, and there's the people like, I don't know why you're doing it. I can't see that. You're just like, you what, you got baptized? Blah, 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 blah. That's not doing it. It's just the, just the haters, right? They're just hating on Jesus, hating on God. They think you're stupid for reading your Bible. They think your posts are stupid about Christianity. You know, they think your warnings about the state of the world and the direction of the world is foolishness. And so, you know, it just they've always been there. <laughs> they've always been there, guys. Just get used to it. Accept it. It is what it is. I was one of those. <laughs> that was me. God set me free, man. Um, so anyway, they, they all complain. Verse 7. <sighs> what did they complain about there? He's going to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. You don't hang out with sinners. What are you doing hanging out with sinners? It was, it, that was a common complaint because he hung out with sinners. And what, Remember a, a different verse, a uh, different chapter, the, the, that, that complaint came up. And he, what did he say? He said, uh, you know, I, the, the sick have need for a physician. Those who are well have no need for a physician. I'm going to where I'm needed. I'm going to the sick and broken people. Like that's, he's like, that's what I do. By the way, if you're ever sick and broken and, and just desperate, that's what God does. Come to him. He's been repairing and restoring and, and taking care of people since the beginning of time. Right? You can come to him. He knows what he's doing. It's what he does every day. Every second of every day, he's, he's, he's in that mode. So, just saying. Jesus' plans are clearly seen here. Zacchaeus was obviously ripe for picking, right? I wonder if Zacchaeus, maybe Zacchaeus was the reason to go to Jericho on this trip. You know, maybe Zacchaeus was the reason. He's like, you know what? We're going to go through Jericho, guys. Why are we going through Jericho? We've, we've already hit that city. Yeah, we're good. Let's just go. <laughs> sure enough, he's hey, you know, and it was noteworthy enough to put in our word. <laughs> Verses seven through ten. There, then they show us what happened. Uh, you know, while others criticized Jesus uh, for you know for eating with sinners, Zacchaeus took action and he used what he had for good, didn't he? We see that. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I've rest I'm restoring it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. He's there eating dinner with him at that point uh, because he's the son of Abraham. So this was a Jew. He goes, and for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, meaning Zacchaeus was lost and now he is found. You were lost, now you are found. I was lost, now I'm found. And when we, when we become found, we go, what do I need to do? And Zacchaeus, top of his list, he's like, man, I've been cheating people for years. I need to restore what I've done. I need to make it right. Sure, it's forgiven, but I need to make, it, I need to make this right. Not for, for, to earn forgiveness, but because it's the right thing to do. People that are, are made right and in right relationship will want to do the right things. Right, even at personal sacrifice. So while others, like I said, Zacchaeus took action and he gave half to the poor. He restored to those that he had cheated. So here's, here's what I wanted to say is that when Jesus moves you, go for it. We're talking about, we're talking about using, using what you've been given. Okay, Use what God's given you. Use what he's given you. And when he was moving in you to do that, go for it. Zacchaeus was moved to take action. I'm just encouraging you that when you feel that stirring up and maybe you start, your heart starts to go a little faster, maybe I should, you know, I don't know. Yeah. We were talking at the men's group and saying like, uh, Neil, I think you might've brought it up and talking about how like, should I go talk to that person and share the gospel? Should I, should I go talk to them? And I, and I forget who it was, but it's just like, you know, we want to say like, well, is that from the Lord? Yeah, it's from the Lord. Matthew, I think you said it, you know, and it's just like, that's not the enemy that would say, like, <laughs> go, go share the gospel. It's like, it's like, yeah, go for it. When you're stirred up, like that, you've got that idea. And if it squares up with scripture and it's, it's in his will, like, dude, go, go. Part of our problem in the church that we have in the Western church is that people aren't going. They are takers and not givers. 
And, and we will all fall, I will fall into that because we're consumer, that's our world is consumer mentality. What are you gonna do for me? And da, 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 and I don't like I don't like my subscription anymore, I cancel it. I don't like my church anymore, I cancel it. I don't, what, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do for me? What are you gonna do for me? Right? And then it becomes taking rather than giving. And so when, I'm, I'm encouraging you guys that when Jesus is stirring you up to do something and it squares up with his word, go. Do it, man. Do it. Whether you're five years old, 55 years old, or 105 years old. If you're 106, you don't have to. If you're four, no, just kidding. Um, it's important. It's important. It's all his anyway, guys. We, we only have so much time. Time is something as you get older, like you start to see it differently, don't you? You're like, I don't know how much, like, we never know how much time we have, but the older you get, the more you go, yeah, but I'm running out of it. It's like when you, you flip the hourglass over and you realize there's less on top than there is at the bottom, you know? And you're like, a little urgency, you know, a little urgency. I'm going to tell you, it's always urgent. <laughs> we shouldn't have to wait to that point, right, where we have that. But, you know, it's all his anyway. You know, Lord, forgive us for holding back. Lord, forgive us for, for not taking action, for not engaging our faith. Verse 11. Let's continue on here. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Remember, the common theme, the common belief, church, for, from the Jewish mindset was that the Messiah would come, he would overthrow the Roman government at that time and establish the kingdom of God once and for all. That's that was the mindset. That was the belief. They kind of, they 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 merged the first coming and the second coming of the Messiah into one event. They're two different things, obviously, right? We see that now. It's easy for us to see it. It was harder back then, though, right? Um, and so he's correcting this. He 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 didn't just let them have false you know, wrong teaching or wrong thinking. It says that they thought that the kingdom of God would come immediately. So he's getting ready to tell this parable. And here's the parable. It says, therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minus and said to them, do business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So one of, this, one of the purposes of this parable, we'll pause there for a second. By the way, um, don't forget, you can text in questions. Okay, That's a great opportunity for you guys to get answers. One of the purposes of this parable was to refute this whole kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is coming now, immediately, like it's happening. And maybe it's this Jesus guy, he's gonna do it, man, he's gonna overthrow the kingdom, he's gonna punch Caesar in the face, it's gonna be awesome. Um, it, so that's, that was one of it, he wanted to refute that, right? Um, and so he tells this story, he sets this up, he talks about the master. He says, hey, the master was going away, right? what it says there. A certain noble man went into a far country to receive himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants. We got this master. He's going to be going away. He expected his servants to do business while he was gone. He's like, hey, I've got all this stuff. Come on. Come on, guys. Servants. Come, come here. Yeah, all of you. Yep. Here. And he hands it out. I want you to go do business. Here's a sack of money, whatever it is, right? Here's these resources. I want you to do business in my stead. I'm going to be gone for a little while, and I'm going to come back. See what he's doing? We already know the context. He's, the Bible says the context of why he's telling us. Because he, Jesus, the master, is going to be going away for a while. It's coming up quickly in the narrative, in the, chrono, the chronology here. Because he's going to be going to Jerusalem for the last time here. And so he's going away, and he's going to be coming back. He's saying, while I'm gone, I want you to be active and do the work do carry out my wishes you see that you see the parallels here i hope just like now jesus is ascended now and he expects us to use what we have for the kingdom of god so the servants 
He says, I, he called 10 of his servants. He delivered them 10. I didn't look up the pronunciation for this. Minus or minus? I'm going to say minus. And said to them, do business until I come. Right? Us Christians are the servants in this parable. Right? And he expects us to use what we have for the kingdom. Using modern terms. Right? The city, now look at this, verse 14. This kind of puzzles me, right? It says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation. They organized a little disgruntled crew. <laughs> they sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Who does that represent in this parable, guys? The, the, the Pharisees, the Jews, right? The, Obviously, not all Jews felt that way. However, specific, of, short, of course, the small Pharisee group, but then even other Jews as well, they've really rejected him as a whole. And that's what's going to be happening. They're going to be calling out for his crucifixion, crucifying, crucifying. And that's the Jews, Jewish nation as a whole that's rejecting him. And that's the citizens that they should know. You're my, you're my people. You're my people. And you're rejecting me, right? In our modern terms, these would be non-believers, using just you know kind of current terminology, applying it to us. Um, just in this little thing, and again, as we talk about using what we have for the Lord, be a servant. Be a servant. Why do you have what you have? Well, I don't. I don't want to use what I have, for the, dude. He gave it to you. Or some of you might be thinking, "Oh, I don't have anything." Yeah, you do. You do. Ask God to show you what you have, because you do. You have stuff. You may have material things. You may have uh, monetary things. You may have uh, personality that can be used. You may have uh, skills, talents, learned abilities, all the mind. <laughs> do you have minds? <laughs> right? Be a servant. Don't be a rebel. Don't be rebellious. You know, there's a part of, there's a part of us that has that, right? And I've talked about this before and just kind of like, it's kind of in me, and I, I fight that. I fight that, and you're like, government, overthrow the government. Arr, you know, it's like my mindset. You know, it's, it's like, you're coming at me, I'm gonna come at you, right? It's just like this, there's a part of us that is that, especially, I don't know if it's kind of like an American thing too, probably, right? Because it's like our roots was a rebellion against the king of England, all for good reasons in my opinion. But, you know, like, but there's a part, there's a part of us that needs to be guarded with that though, right? Like, now we, should we rebel against God? No way, man. So when God is moving in you to do something and use what you have for the Lord, then don't make excuses, man. I don't need to do that. God, you can't tell me what to do. You know, we start, whoa, dude, what are you doing? Be a, what is a, that's not a good stir, a ser, uh, servant, good steward. Be a servant. A servant says, yes, boss. Gladly. Gladly. I'll do it. Thank you. Thank you for the thank you for the honor of being, uh, you know, called upon to do this. Right, that's what we should be. So I'm encouraging you guys to be a servant, not a rebel, when it comes to using what you have for the Lord. So let's continue. The parable continues in verse 15. And so it was when he returned, he the master. The master's gone. He's gone for X amount of time. He comes back. He returns having received the kingdom. So now he's back with the kingdom. It's time. It's time. So this is Jesus. This is a picture of Jesus' second coming, okay? It's time now. He's coming back, and he's, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading, right? That's verse 15 there. He says, hey, what'd you do? Come forward. What'd we do? What'd we do? I'm excited to hear. I'm excited. How'd you do, sermon? Did you crush it? You know? Verse, look at verse 16 there, guys. Read with me. Then came the first servant, saying, Master, your mina has earned 10. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in the very little, have authority over 10 cities. Oh, remember, this is the master's coming with the kingdom. This is, he's directly talking about the second coming and the millennial reign and coming in and saying, hey, we're, we're going to establish cities and you're going to have 10. You're going to rule over 10 of them because you did such a great job. Verse 18, 
the second service servant came saying, Master, your mina has earned five. Likewise, he said to him, you also, you're over five cities. Then another came and saying, Master, here's your mina back. I, I, you gave it to me and I kept it hidden. It doesn't say hidden. I'll read what's on there. Which I've kept and put away in a handkerchief. He took the mina and he put it, folded it up, put it in his drawer under his socks. I don't know. Right? I don't think they had socks. Did they wear socks? They wore sandals. They didn't even have socks. They didn't have to. They never lost a sock. <laughs> they didn't have ma- unmatching pairs. I've got one unmatching pair, and it's driving me nuts. And I swear, I'm not, if I throw away the one, I'm going to find the other one, aren't I? <laughs> All right. Where are we at? He says, hey. Here it is back. He's trying to give him back what he was given. (laughs) Did he use it at all? No. What did he do with it? Did Did he even talk to people about it? No. It was hidden and put away. How many Christians hide their faith today? They take it. They take their skills. They take their worship and their praise and their spiritual gift. And they take it and their witness and they put it away. Oh, 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 Jesus, you're there. Oh, well, no, no, I'm a Christian. Hey, I'm in, I'm in. I'm your, I'm your son, I'm your daughter. See, that's a dangerous place to be in, church, because there's some people that think they're Christians that aren't. That's not the case here. This was an actual believer, okay? Other verses talk about that, you know, where it says like, you know, I was like, I don't know you. Who are you? Trippy, huh? That's not you guys. Talk to you. Talk to everybody in this room. Right? So it's good that you have a heart for the Lord. But anyway, here we are. This person, the master's return. He gets it out and he says, here you go. And he's, verse 21, here's the master's response. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the servant's continued thing. He says, here you go, master, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit. You reap what you did not sow. Huh. It's almost like an attitude there, isn't it? You do. (laughs) Almost like it, right? A little bit of, that's kind of weird, huh? I knew you were strict, austere, right? I knew you were strict. So you know what? I just kept it. I didn't lose it. I didn't lose it. It's here. I didn't do anything with it. In the master's response, Jesus said, well, the master in the parable, said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man. I was a strict guy, really? Okay, well, and I collect what I did not deposit and I reap what I don't sow? Well, why then didn't you at least put my money in the bank that at my, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? Like you could have at least done that. You could have done something, the bare minimum. You could have done something. You know, the first two had a return of 10 to one, right? Hey, you gave me 10, I, I, or you, you, or, I'm sorry, you gave me a, a Mina and I gave you 10 back. You got a 10 to 1 return. Second guy has a 5 to 1 return. And their rewards are, are comparable, aren't they? Well, you know what? Like The kingdom is here. It's time. It's go time. Master's back to stay. And guess what? You got your reward, man. 10 cities, 5 cities. What? You just gave me back what I gave you. Like, what is that? That's not even, you didn't do anything. You, you literally, what did you do? You hit it? You hit it? And you're talking to me about how I'm strict and like you think that that was okay? Like, what are you doing? He didn't do anything with it. He didn't, he didn't understand. He didn't understand the heart of the master, did he? Right? This in the parable, the serv- this servant didn't understand the heart of the master. That he should the, the, the master desires, Jesus desires, God desires for you to be active with your faith. He desires that for you. Because it's about 
it's not about, life is not about you. It's about the kingdom. It's about him. It's about making, it's about knowing God and making him known. It's about loving God and loving others. That's the kingdom of God. And when we don't do that, we're not fulfilling our mission. We have a life mission. Every single believer on the planet since the beginning of time has the same mission, and that's to love God and love others, to know God and to make him known. That's our mission. We all have that in common. Now, the roles may change and vary slightly from time to time, but that, at the bare minimum, that's what we should be doing, church. And when we don't do that, then you don't know the, you don't know the Father. If you, don't, if you don't see that, then you, you don't fully know him, and you need to pray, Lord, show me your heart. Show me what to do. Think about it, guys. The, the world is broken. It's messed up. It's getting worse. Maybe it gets better. I don't know. It's, it has, you know, it has ups and downs historically. I don't think it's going to get better. I think it's going to keep getting worse. That's just me. What are you going to do about it? Well, or are you going to do something about it, man? Just use what you have for the Lord. Know God, make him known. Love God, love others. Simple. Do it. Do it. The good servant, the good servant uses what he has for the kingdom. Right, church? The good servant, you want to be a good servant? Or do you want to be the one that when, when Jesus comes back for you, Jesus is like, hey, you know, hi, son, hi, daughter. Let's, let's do this, but I. Sorry, you didn't, you didn't do anything. So you're in, but it's like no, like you're just like a a, a pew potato, <laughs> you know. You just kind of just sat there, man. Like I don't have anything for you. Salvation, you know, heaven. But the good servant uses what he has for the kingdom. The Lord has entrusted us, his servants, with the task of using what he has given us during our time on earth until his return. Do you recognize, church, what the Lord has given you? You have a voice. You have a voice to speak truth. With your voice, you can declare the gospel. You can offer prayer. You have a mind to create things that bless people, to be thoughtful and mindful of each other. You have eyes that can see the needs around you. Are they open? You have ears to listen to who's hurting around you or to listen in, to someone who is in pain or has ideas or needs someone just to, to just do that, just to listen. You have the scripture that will equip you and it can equip others and bring hope, encouragement, guidance, correction, resources. You have resources to further God's message. You have something. We live in the most affluent nation on the planet. You have resources, financial, physical. You have physical resources. You have, the whole, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in you. <laughs> you better believe that you can be used. Wake up. Wake up and, and, and be active. Be engaged. Comfort, help, teach, give words, give prayer. These are the things that the Holy Spirit, Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit will come. I've got to go because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to do all these things with you, in you, and through you. Let the Holy Spirit fill you up, overflowing. And you need to, some of you Christians, some of you need to be splashing on people. Okay? You need to be sloshing around, so filled with the Holy Spirit. It's splashing on people. Like, whoa, wow. And we think of it as an offensive thing, but like this, the picture it with good stuff, like hot day, you want to get sprayed, right? You know? Um, and so think of it that way. Like that's, man, you've got, you are equipped, spiritual gifts. Think you don't have anything? You don't have anything to share? I don't know what I can do. What more do I need to share with you guys? You have a voice, you have eyes, you have ears, you have a mouth, you have a brain, you have imagination, you have creativity, you have skills and talents and abilities, you have the Holy Spirit who's given you all of these different things. Go, use it. The good servant is the one who uses what he has for the kingdom of God. Amen? So you're equipped now. You are being equipped too. I'm equipping you right now. 
right? I'm equipping you. I'm, I'm trying to get your brain switched on, your eyes open, right? I'm trying to, I, every day I pray for you and I, 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 uh, I'm praying for the study and I'm, I'm like, here we go. I'm going to equip them. I want you guys to be equipped, not just to, not just to put it away. Use it, baby. I want you guys to not be putting stuff away. You remember, this is, this is going to date me, all right? Rambo, okay? It's not my notes. It's dangerous ground. It's not my notes. Going off script. Ram, Rambo had, he had the bandolier. He, of course, had his knife, right? But he's strapped, dude. He's got knives and boots. He's got the boots himself. He's got fists. He's got unlimited supply of arrows. I know, just unlimited, right? And just, right, he's got arrows and guns. And every time he drops a gun, he picks up two more. I mean, I think at one point he had two, right? I mean, it's just, he's equipped. He's equipped and he's going and he's doing and he's engaged and he's, he's active, right? Be, that's us. Be Lambo. We're lambs. Lambo, Rambo. <laughs> oh, man. So my point is go, guys. Use what you have. There's, there's no excuse. Was there an excuse for this, this servant who's like, here you go back? <laughs> How weird would he feel like everybody else brought forth like, boom, boom, boom. And then you're like, <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Was there an excuse? Kids, did the, kid, did the servant that gave just gave the one back to him, did, they, did he have an excuse? Kids? Huh? No, he didn't have an excuse. There's no excuse. Whoa. What would you do with what I gave you? Uh, I didn't have anything. Yeah, you did. You had the thing. Oh, well, you're right. But uh, uh, nothing? <laughs> right? Like, there's no excuse. Don't be like that one servant, you guys. So who are, how about this? Let me, give, let me give you even, let me get your brain going on this, okay? Who are you discipling? I'm not equipped to disciple. Yes, you are equipped to disciple somebody. And if you're not, who's, who are you seeking discipling from? It's one or the other. Either you're discipling somebody or you're getting discipled. Or both, possibly. Okay? It's biblical. The older men would disciple and train up, teach the younger. And older women would teach the younger. And don't wait for someone to come to you. You don't wait for someone to come to you. Go seek it out. <laughs> Maybe if you're a kid, you know, kids they aren't thinking that way. You know, a child or something. But we're grown adults. Like, go re search, search that out. Like, hey, I need to be accountable in this. Or I need to da da da. Or you know what? You've, you've got something. That, can we just meet for coffee or something like that? I remember what, in my walk, like, there's a point in time where I'm like, this person seems to know. I kind of resonate with them. They seem to be more mature than me in the Lord. Hey, can we? And I approached them and I said, can we just... I'm, you know, once a week, just kind of get together and just just talk, maybe have some coffee or something, maybe share a bite to eat or something. And I did that for for years. You know, that's actually the pastor that ended up marrying us, um, Robert Cosby. Anyway, so who are you discipling? Who are you sharing the gospel with? How is your prayer life? Uh, who are you sharing the word with? How are you engaging in God's kingdom? How are you being Engaged to, to be equipped, maybe even, okay? Finally, I think I've got this discipling thing down, like as far as the uh, program, if you want to call it that. Just a system. I want to give you guys kind of a system. Discipling doesn't need to be a crazy thing. Just meet together, study the word, talk, pray. What does they have to the Lord? Like, they just be there with each other. Like That's discipling, right? Like mentoring. Um. I've also got some resources here. I think we've got it. You know, we'll look at that tomorrow. But, um, and I've got like a, a system. I'm going to give you guys some. I want to again equip you for the work of the ministry. So I've got. So if you're like, hey, you know, I need to be. Yeah, I need to be a disciple. Or I need to be discipling somebody. Then I've got some tools. We'll have some tools for you. I'll probably announce it next Sunday, officially. And so just to give you guys that. So it's coming. But there's other things too, right? I mean, sharing the gospel, praying for people. All kinds of things, right? There's, there's needs everywhere, guys. The good servant uses what he has for the kingdom. Um, last section here.
Verse 24. So that's, that's the end of his... Uh, no, this is, this, the parable continues. Uh, he said to those who stood by, this, this, is, this is the parable now. He just talked to the servant and said, well, why don't you at least put it in the bank so I can earn interest, the bare minimum. Then he turns to those who stood by in the parable and he says, take the meter from him, give it to the one who has 10. What they said to him, master, he, is, he already has 10. He says, for I say to you, that to everyone who has will be given and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine, I'm talking about those citizens now, who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Jesus, whoa, dude. What's up with the warm fuzzy Jesus? What happened to that guy? I want to hit. Many times, we've read it many times, the book of Luke. We see Jesus is the full package, man. And those who have made themselves willingly an enemy of God, guess what? They're an enemy of God. They've chosen that. They've decided to do that. They've decided to rebel. God doesn't send anybody to hell, guys. People choose him. People choose that. Yes, people go to hell. I get that. I'm not saying that they don't. I'm saying that they, it's not like he grabbed them and sent them up. Mm, right? His, God is willing that none would perish, but all would come to repentance and everlasting life. Right? The heart of the Father is He wants everybody in. The harsh reality, the sad reality, is that people choose not God. We were reading, Daniel and I are going through the book of Revelation, which is again our next book, and, so, and it talks about there's a point there when all of these crazy judgments, cataclysmic things are happening, and rather, and, and the people go, this is God. They know it's God doing it, and they go into the mountains, and they pray that the mountains would crush them, and they just die. They would rather die than bow a knee to God and surrender to Him. There are, and us as believers, like, well, how could they possibly? I don't know. I don't know why. how somebody gets to that point, how somebody can just reject God. I've shared truth with some people, and they, I'm sharing it. And it's, to me, it's like two plus two equals four. And they look you dead face, and they go, nope. And you're like, dude, l l watch, watch. <laughs> Count with me. <laughs> Count. And they're like, five. I'm like, no. Die. What? There's a, there's, a rebelliousness, there's a rebelliousness in the heart of man. It's just there, man. And, they, and, and so, yeah, like, People reject God. And he's not going to drag people kicking and screaming to heaven, you know, spitting on them, you know, which is, that was, and then we're going to see that they're spitting on Jesus, hating him on the cross. It's coming up. So here he says, hey, bring him before, my, bring him before me. They didn't want me to reign over him? Then, okay. You don't want me to reign over you. I will honor your request. You don't have me. Right? The servant who did nothing with what he had, he received nothing. The one who had worked extra hard, he got a little bonus. God sees, guys. He sees. God notices when you sacrifice. There's not a single sacrifice you've made for the kingdom of God that he hasn't noticed. That approaching that person who's unlovable, loving your enemy, not wanting to, you know, do that thing, and, but doing it anyway. He sees that. He sees every little thing. He sees the sacrifice you've made. As for the hard-hearted citizens, they received their just reward, right? He did. And this is the last point. Church, there's a cost either way. There's a cost when using what you have for the Lord, correct? Correct? It costs you something. You're going to have, and I don't mean just financially here. Yes, financially, but broader than that. Because you're not, it's your bank account. <laughs> that is, the bank account is not your, who, who, who you are, right? Like it's, a, it, it's an extension, I guess, of a part of you in some ways. It's part of your life, but that's not, that's not the everything. Um, it's your skills, your talents, your abilities. We talked about this, right? Okay. There's a cost to use those things for the kingdom. It'll cost you time. It'll cost you effort. It'll cost you things. It'll cost you uh, some energy, right? It's going to cost you. I'm going to tell you this. There's a cost if you don't do it. 
You don't see that cost now. You will one day when you get to heaven and you're like, oh. The Bible talks about, it says that all of our good works are going to be tried by fire. This is on Judgment Day. The Judgment Day for Christians is way different than Judgment Day for the non-believers. We just saw that. <laughs> Citizens are not going to be, yeah, that judgment's different. We're judged differently. We're judged by our works. So like, hey, the things you did. Hey, servant, what would you do with what I gave you? There's that day. And that's going to, it says it's going to be tried as if by fire. So I, I, in my mind, it's just how I picture it. Like there's this big, like, remember like the cartoon, like conveyor belts, you know, and then there's like this big block in the middle that, you know, either stamping thing, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, right? Anyway, and the conveyor belt comes out and then there's a box and all of a sudden the box is complete or whatever it is. Anyway. And then well, I'm picturing like this furnace, right? Like the conveyor belt of like good works. And you're like, hey, empty the, empty the pockets. I'm like, cool, I got this stuff. And it's like going down the line and then out comes what remains. So it gets tested by fire. The fire, test of fire is, did you do it in pride? Did you do it in your own strength? Did you do it for you, really, you know? And then the stuff that, and, and so all that stuff is it's like wood, hay, and stubble. It just gets, it just goes up in, in smoke. And it just, it's nothing. And so I think some of the things that we thought were like a big, dude, that's a big one. I did that thing. And it's like, hey, <laughs> what happened to it? You know, what the heck? Because we, we had the wrong motive or it was for us and it was about us or something like that. It happens. It happens. That we're all going to have some of that in all those moments. But there's going to be other things you're like, because remember, wood, hay, stubble gets uh, consumed, and then what's plopping out the other end is gemstones and gold and all this other cool stuff. Just work with me here. for It's a metaphor, right? But uh, it's, it's biblical. And sometimes there's going to be some of that stuff come out. You're like, where'd that diamond come from? Oh, you know what? Um, you got a phone call at like 2 in the morning, somebody that was really hurting, and you answered your phone, and you stayed up with that person for like a couple of hours and talked with them, and then you know, you made sure to stay connected with them. That, like, I saw that. I saw that you reached out to somebody um, at the grocery store who seemed really distraught and you just offered prayer and you prayed with them. I saw that. And that person, his entire life absolutely changed. Matter of fact, George, come over here. I want to introduce you. Dude, these are snapshots of heaven, right? So why wouldn't we use what we have for the kingdom of God. In church, if we don't, there's a cost to where nothing's on that conveyor belt and nothing comes through. That's a big cost. You pay the cost now or you pay it later, right? That's why the Bible talks about investing in the kingdom of God. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven which moth and rust do not destroy, right? So do it. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Servant. Be a good servant, right? There's a cost if you don't. Is it going to cost you something here? Yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> Jesus would not tell you to do something that wasn't worth it. Maybe we can just take him at face value that like, hey, I should do this. And like he has what's, he has my, my, uh, the best for me. So here's a couple action steps for you, okay? First off, you can't give if you don't have any margin in your life. If you are so like just like filled with other junk, like picture a glass, if you're filled with other junk, fears, doubts, failures, busyness, all the things we talked about in the beginning, if you're, I, I should have, if I had thought about it, I would have done a, oh, this would have been such a good time for that example. All right, whatever, it's done. Um, you know, if it's full with other stuff, you can't fill it with the Lord. It's full. Maybe the Lord's in there, right? But it's part of it. But if you can empty yourself of self, you can, em you can free up some of the things in your life, all of a sudden you've got more capacity, more space, more margin to be used by the Lord. Like I said, splash on people, right? Carve out margin. That's the first thing you need to do, okay? Get your life in order. Get your life in order. Come on. It doesn't take you that long. Probably stop doing something today. It's a waste of Everybody here has time wasters, okay? Don't tell me you don't have time. Baloney. Baloney. I don't believe it, okay? This is to me too, okay? Uh, consider your resources. Some of you haven't taken inventory. I don't have anything. I don't have any skills. Some of you are like self-deprecating. Like, I just suck. I'm blah, 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 blah. 
Well, you just use your mind to do that. So use your mind to do things that are that. You just use your mouth to say that. So use your mouth to proclaim. Consider your resources. At a base level, you got something, okay? You know, you know, the gospel, you know, John 3, 16. If you don't know the gospel, let's talk after church. We're going to talk about that. Actually, no, if you don't, if you don't know the gospel, man's sin falls short of God. Jesus came to pay for sin. We need to repent of our sins and come to him. There's the gospel. Ten seconds, Okay. That's it. Can we get further detail? Yes, but that's the gospel. Now you know it, okay? Consider your resources. Everybody at least has that, okay? Share it. Get, take inventory and consider your resources and then get busy doing the work. Is this hard, guys? I'm sorry, is this complex? No. No, we make it complex. And too many people get stuck over here because they're just so, they're doing other things that are unprofitable. Waste time wasters. We live for self. We're takers. We're not givers, right? We get stuck over there. Or we hide our resources. We don't do anything with them. Yeah, I used to do that. Yeah, man, back in the day, I, just, I used to do that. Yeah, I just kind of stopped. Consider your resources. Maybe it's time for you to dust off some of those old skills that you had growing up. Or kids. Maybe it's time for you to discover them. Discover who God made you to be. Right? Discover what God made you to be. How exciting that is. Parents, how exciting it is to, to equip our children and to raise them up and to be discerning of how it is. Train your children up in the way that they should go. How has God wired this child? What is the way that they should go? Lord, show me the way that this child should go. That's what that verse means, by the way. That we as parents are accountable to the Lord with how we help the children to reveal what their mission of life is. And then we set them, we turn them loose like an arrow. The Bible talks about that too. And like we aim and we release, we soar, right? Carve out margin, guys. Consider those resources and then just get busy doing it. Go. Figure out the rest on the way, man. <laughs> Go, do it. Amen? That's it. Use what you have been given for the Lord. Father, we worship you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you for what you've given us. We don't deserve it, but you gave it. And we worship you, Lord. Forgive us for the times that we hide the things you've given us. We don't do anything with them. They're just like tools rusting in a toolbox. Equip us, Lord, and motivate us. Kick us in the butt if we need to get going. In Jesus' name, amen.